Welcome to episode 126 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. I have a friend, a mentor, and a colleague on the call with me today, and his name is Kane Minkus. Uh, he is literally a rock star, and you'll hear why in a second as I go through uh, his bio. Uh, Kane has shared stages with leaders such as Richard Branson, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, Bill Clinton, Bob Proctor, Lisa Nichols, Frank Kern, Vishen, Lakiani, Tim Ferriss, and Randy Zuckerberg, just to name a few. And I know I could go on all day there with, uh, with the amount of people that uh, Kane has shared the stage with. Now, Kane and his wife, Alessia, are among the most impactful business mentors on the planet. They've reached over 3 million, 3 million business owners online and another 600,000 offline. Their award-winning strategies cover key business aspects such as business strategy, marketing, sales, leadership, and technology. Uh, their business industry rock star and their senior advisory team have collectively generated $2 billion in revenue uh, through the 60 companies they've started from scratch. Uh, they've also coached and consulted massive brands such as Sony, Universal Pictures, Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, Electronic Arts, Microsoft, and Apple. So as you can tell, I'm very excited there to welcome Kane. Kane, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Kevin. Every time my bio gets read, I always wish my mother-in-law was listening. <laughs> Uh, that's right. That's right. And Kane, so good to have you here. Now I know you're uh, you're beaming into us uh, all the way from Sardinia in Italy, where you spend your summers. Yeah, we we so I'm American uh, by birth, but I've spent most of my life all over the world. And I uh, started my first company at 19, and was very clear that I didn't want to spend my life just growing up and living and working and being in the country I started it. Um, there's a bit of a story behind that, but I won't go into it now. And so we've been traveling constantly. We used to travel 200 days a year. I did that for 15 years um, to 32 countries a year, training, educating, and sharing, and mentoring. And uh, my wife is from Italy, from Rome, and we do everything together. And so we spend the summers where she spent her summers, which is in the island of Sardinia. It's beautiful here. So we're here now. Very beautiful. And came to have that level of uh, um, energy and endurance for that long to be on the road for that amount of time, you must clearly have a uh, passion and a purpose driving this. So I'd love to hear a little yeah. bit about you know, what is it that fires you up and inspires you uh, to, to, to give and serve uh, so much as you do? People have always asked me that, that, you know, I would, I would sometimes fly 22 hours on a plane from, you know, out of the U S uh, to California to Dubai and, and literally jump right off the plane and jump into a three day event in front of 2000 people and leave for three days, you know, nonstop between jet lag, where it didn't matter. I was just go, go, go. And people would always say, how do you have so much energy? And I would say, look, it's the cocaine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We're actually health nuts. So nobody get concerned. Uh, but uh, you know, it's a good question. So, you know, there's the old, there's, there's the kind of the old adage that when you're at your calling, you're really tapped into your source and the universal source of energy. And I really do believe that, um, but, you know, there is more than just uh, mind clarity that, you know, my, my wife and I are actually, we're really health nuts. Um, and I have been actually since I was a teenager, uh, a very, very funny and small incident happened when I was 10 years old. My mother took me to a doctor. They had my blood tested and they came to my mother and they said, your son has very high cholesterol. And she freaked out. Like she was like, you know, she like, she's a bad mother. Right. And so suddenly our life turned into like absolute health, <laughs> like a health store <laughs> in our house. And so I just grew up with this very, very high consciousness towards healthy foods, healthy living, uh, healthy eating, you know, very, you know, very active lifestyle. And so we are very, very oriented into that. How do we engage in very, very high energy? I love to get up, get rolling, have, you know, huge amounts of energy for my day from beginning to end. And so we're very attentive to both how we live, we're attentive to, of course, our mindset and how we think and how we're engaging and that we are doing the things that we're absolutely passionate to do. Uh, I've never worked for anybody. I started my first business, actually. I became a contractor at 16. I was a musician and I started playing piano uh, all over. I started touring as a musician in bands. I was playing you know, piano at different piano malls and things at 16 years old when I could drive. And so I've always worked for myself. I've always done what I love to do. And I've always spent every minute of my day doing what I wanted to do. So to me, those are some of the keys to always having as much energy as you can have. Amazing. Can you tell us about that leap? How do you go from being a 16 year old, uh, you know, musician to now being, uh, you know, one of the world's leading business mentors? Well, okay. So it's an interesting story and, and it actually stems from, uh, you know, sort of a conflict with my father, uh, which I think is where a lot of good stories start <laughs> for young men. <laughs> Um, so I grew up in a, in a my, my, older, my father was a chief financial, well, he still is a chief financial officer, actually, but he, uh, growing up, my father was a chief financial officer for publicly held companies. 
And uh, essentially for 40 years, he, he was a CFO and he was a very high ranking executive and very, very large companies. And so he's very conservative guy. He wanted uh, his kids to be in very conservative industries. I have two older siblings. He wanted my older brother to be a doctor and my older sister to be, you know, in business. And he wanted me to be a lawyer. You know, it's just very, very standard. Uh, you know, you go to school, you get your grades, you get your degrees, you get your graduate degrees, you go to work, you work for somebody, you work your way up, you have a solid, you know, executive role and you make your hundreds of thousands and you, you know, you have your, your happy life. Um, except I was totally not on that track. And really my dad was not happy. I, you know, I saw him go to work every day in a suit and tie and he always went grumpy and he always came home grumpy and he was just a grumpy guy. And so I didn't know what it was about me, but very early on, I realized I was not going to follow his path. I was not going to be some conservative executive putting on my Windsor knot tie, you know, every day. So I happened to get into music very early on. My older brother and I are both musicians, although my older brother did cave in and he became a surgeon. He's a, he's a great surgeon, although he loves that. Uh, there's a lot of love for music. And so I decided early on I was going to pursue music. And that was a lot of turmoil because in my family, that was just not, there was no option to just be a musician, right? So my dad used to constantly say to me, there's no money in music. You got to figure something else out. Um, but I did, and I, I persevered and I decided, look, there's got to be a way to do what you love to do and make a lot of money. Um, so I kept going. And by the time I was 13 years old, actually, I was touring with bands and doing things mostly for fun. I started putting on concerts because I wanted it to become as big as possible, as fast as possible. And I learned that if I partnered with charity, uh, you know, NPOs and charities, I could maybe throw concerts for them or I could get involved in their shows and things like that. I could start performing to very big audiences, which were, you know, like 1,000, 2,000 people at that time, um, you know, very early. And by the time I was 16, then when I could start to drive and get myself around, I was touring, you know, with bands, not so locally. And I was, you know, performing and making money. And it really, it was this entrepreneurial spirit of how can I take what I love to do and turn it into something impactful, make money with it and do what I want to do on a daily basis. I just didn't believe that you couldn't do what you love to do because I used to say to my dad, there are people who make money in music. And he'd say, like whom? And I would think of my idols, Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, you know, Madonna, not that she was an idol, but she was certainly making a lot of money. And he would say they got lucky. And, uh, and that is uh, that was his his perspective on how things worked is that uh, they got lucky. And so I really had to uh, start start with the um, with the uh, concept of the idea here that people uh, got lucky and that's how they actually uh, were a success. Um, and that was that never sat with me. I thought, no, it's, it can't be like that. There's got to be something else. But that was my dad's ideals. And so a lot of times I work with entrepreneurs and they've grown up in ideals or values or concepts uh, where they are not their own. They're not their own values. They're not their own ideas. They're not their own concepts. Um, and they're working against those ideals, those beliefs, those values or those concepts in order to, um, to have the life that they want. And it's very important that they have somebody that can help them transcend those beliefs or have completely different beliefs or see the world from a completely different place. So anyways, I kept going. And uh, by the time I was uh, about uh, 18 years old, I had become a record producer for Sony. Um, and I then ended up going to school at a school called Berkeley School of Music, which was a top music school in the world. Um, and then I ended up uh, going through a whole world where I was working with famous people, Celine Dion, Jessica Simpson, Ricky Martin, uh, you know, D Destiny's Child, uh, you know, you name it. We, we worked with all these huge bands and acts and artists. And this was back, you know, 25 years ago. So that, that era of people. Uh, and it wasn't long before essentially something happened at Sony, which was called Napster, uh, where the whole industry essentially collapsed. And when the industry collapsed because everybody started sharing files, um, Sony basically stopped paying all the producers and all the, you know, the, the little guys. And so I called up a friend and I said, hey, we're not getting paid, but we're doing the work. Why don't we start our own business? And uh, he said, sounds good. Why don't you move out to California from New York and we'll launch our own business and we'll see how it goes. So that's what I did. I moved to California. I started uh, on a friend's couch and um, he uh, gave me a place to stay while we started our first music business. And uh, we worked for six months on this music business and it didn't go anywhere. Nothing happened. And six months in, he comes into our office and he says, hey, um, my girlfriend is pregnant. So he says, I got six months left to figure this out or I got a baby coming. I'm going to get a job. And I said, no, 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 don't do that. We'll figure this out. We'll figure this out. So I happened to be part of a personal development uh, seminar workshop company. It was called Landmark at the time. And I was going and doing personal development work. And I happened to meet a coach uh, at one of the workshops who essentially what he did is he uh, coached companies, usually larger companies. But when I met him, I told him that we were into media. And he said, you know what? My first company was in media. Let me see if I can help you guys out. 
And he came in and he started coaching us. And within about uh, four or five years, we had the fifth largest media company on the planet in the industry that we were in, which was a focus in on soundtracks for video games at that time. And we just crushed it. And it, it, I realized that actual success in business had very little to do with talent. It has very little to do with drive. It's not that there's, there's you know, none of it. It just has very little to do with it. And it has a lot to do with having mentors that have great systems, that have great uh, foresight, that have great uh, strategies and having doing the right things in the right order. I think it was probably uh, Peter Drucker who might've said that management's uh, or leadership's doing the right things in the right order. I mean, I just realized it's, you know, there's so many people with so much passion and they do things and they're working hard and they're doing it. And it really has very little to do with that. In fact, what I think we'll cover in this uh, interview is some of the secrets to really what does make a massive difference in people having huge success. Yes, we would love to hear that. There's no question for me. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so, so, so one of the things that I'm actually considered a world leading expert and what, what happened was that because we did that so fast, um, I, I had a lot of passions for different businesses and I went, well, gee, if we can do that in, in this area um, and we can do it so fast, why not go do it in many other areas? And I loved food. So we opened restaurants. I loved, uh, you know, technology. So we were opening tech companies. I, I, I fell in love with the, the idea of coaching because uh, someone had really helped us and made a difference. Um, and as a musician, I was still quite a sensitive person. So I loved people and I wanted to make a difference. So we started opening leadership companies and training companies and coaching companies. Before I knew it, I was 29 and I had about 24 different companies uh, and I was worth tens of millions. And I was, you know, just had all these companies, some of them, which I had sold, some of them, which were still going on, some of them, which I had systematized. And I just got that. It was just a, it was just a process. It was a, it was a way of putting together, you know, your concept. So what happened was, is I realized there were a few major things that people are typically not trained in because traditional education doesn't do it. And those are some of the key essences. Now, when I talk about these key essences, cause I would, you know, I've, I've, I've spent years speaking now on stages, about 20 years now on stages, speaking about uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship growth. And to me, there's a, there's a set of formations that happen at different stages in the business that make it grow. And so let me just delineate this really quickly. Cause I, do, I don't like the essence of like, there's three simple things you do in life and then you're a huge success. That's not really true. It's a, it's a cultivation of a, a million different things, but there are some key things that if you don't do or you don't become extraordinary at, you will have a ceiling in terms of how far you can go. So we look at businesses in essentially uh, three stages. We look at them in a startup stage and there's a set of very important things in the startup stage that have to be mastered or done well. Otherwise it'll always just, you know, plug along, very, very high effort, low return. Then that startup stage takes to what we would, we would, we look at it as about 300,000 to 500,000 in revenue that's in US dollars. So no matter, you know, where you're listening from or what currency you're thinking. Um, and then, and then it moves into a scaling stage right around that three to $500,000 mark. And it really gets into scaling about that one to $5 million mark. You know, we've been seeing a lot of people use this word scaling and like scale up your business from, you know, you know, 10,000, um, you know, a year to 10 million, like to us, that's not, that's not when you start looking at scaling. So we've got a, a launch phase, we've got a scaling stage, and then we've got essentially where people start to look at the exit stage. And I've been in venture capital, you know, now for a long time in investing. So there's a, there's a little few other data points along the way here, but that's, and that's how I break up businesses. I go, are you in a launch phase? Are you in a scale phase? Or are you ready to exit your business? That's just kind of how I, I talk to the people that come to me that want me to, to, to privately mentor them or work with them and their businesses or be on their boards. And so let's just start with the launch phase. Because even if your listeners are scaling or even if they're thinking about exiting, what I have found is that I, you know, I've got into tens of thousands of companies personally, like literally, on the phone, on Zoom, in their in their offices over the last you know 20 years. And many times I'm brought into companies personally that are scaling. They might be seven figures or eight figures and they want to grow and exit. But I look at their fundamentals and a lot of their fundamentals were not put in place properly. And therefore we need to get back to the fundamentals because as you scale, the fundamentals, uh, if they're not done properly, will um, it is a little bit like a dam with water. The cracks will start to appear, the water will start to push through and eventually the dam will burst and break and the company will fall apart. And sometimes that fall apart is when we go to exit and the really smart valuation companies, they understand where the cracks are in the wall. And so it may be that you, you know, your business may chug along. You may even be able to go sell it. You may even get interest in it. But if you didn't set up the fundamentals right, you're not gonna get the same valuation for the company because they can see that and they love that. Cause then they go, oh, hey, we can, we can you know, poke in the cracks and say, hey, we were, we're only gonna give you half as much as you should get cause you didn't figure it out ahead of time. So this conversation could actually, even for those that are scaling or exiting, 
will put a, you could put huge amounts of money on the bottom on the line for for you know when they sell. So anyway, see here, here's the 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 first the first most important thing that I think is is overlooked. It's called positioning. And what I become essentially known as as a world expert in is, is in positioning. And I absolutely love positioning. It's one of my favorite topics. And it really is a look at how you position yourself into the hearts and the minds of your marketplace. And it's not just, it, it goes across everything you do from your messaging and your branding to your offers, uh, to the content you put out on social media, to uh, the way you present yourself in the media, the way you present yourself to partners, um, the way you engage your employees. Positioning is about how people perceive everything you're doing and every, every move you're making. It's the way they perceive your value as a product. It's the way they see receive your the value as a company. And by, this, by the way, when I say product, I mean service and technology or anything else that you're doing out there. It doesn't matter. I just call it a product. Uh, but you could be a coach, you know, and I just call your coaching products, products. So it's, it's how people view you and perceive you. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I realized that my father was perceiving musicians and music and the arts as a low valued experience. And I didn't, I had a different perception of it. And so I became fascinated by why some people perceive something as low value while others perceive it as high value. And it, it appeared to me as one of the keys to how you could actually have an impact on changing the way you could experience your life and how people could experience you. You could either be perceived as low value or you could be perceived as high value. And the difference is millions, if not tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars in impact uh, throughout your life. So I became obsessed with this conversation of positioning and not to mention, I started my first businesses in my teenage years and you know, I, I spent a lot of years, I mean, now I'm 45, so, or 44 rather. Uh, my wife always says, you're 44, not 45. And I have this, <laughs> I'm still getting gray. Um, you know, and, and so now, now when I get on stages or I talk to people or I do business and I have such credibility, I mean, we've done over 500 million in our own businesses uh, personally and with our team, we've done, you know, as you know, billions of dollars. Or so now we don't have as much credibility complexities. But when I was 19 years old or 20 years old or 21 years old, and I was going into to pitch at Microsoft or at Apple or at Disney, you know, or Universal, and I was like a kid, you know, and back then it wasn't like, you know, now there's all these tech companies where, you know, oh, if you're a kid, cool kid with an innovative idea, yeah, hey, you know, cool, come on. Well, it wasn't like that back then. It was basically like seniority. And you were a kid and you had to, you had to put in the time and, and, you know, build your credibility and your CV and your back. Well, I want to get going at 19 at 20. I was like, Hey, let's be a success today. Like, why can't we be a success today? That was one of the main things I was doing is I was constantly questioning. And this came from my mother. My mother taught me to constantly question everything, everything, everything. And she was, she was amazing at this. It was question everything. Don't ever settle for what people have told you is the way things work. And, you know, as, as, of, as of recently, we just had a major um, Supreme Court uh, ruling that overruled a, a major case, you know, Roe versus, uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, which has been going on for 50, 60 years, 70 years, women's rights and things like that. We're, we're seeing a lot of, and people would have never believed that that could have ever been overturned. In the first place, they probably never believed that that could have gotten in place. And then they never believed it could ever get overturned. And, and so, you know, I have seen it and you've seen it, whether you've been paying attention or not in your life, but things that we believe could never happen, never happen, they happen. And again, I don't know why I was perceptive of this as a young kid. I think it was just to fight with my dad and prove him wrong. And, you know, it wasn't anything super <laughs> spiritual or anything at the time. But, but I, I started to notice very early on that my dad had one perception. And, you know, as a kid, our, our parents' perception is kind of like it's gospel. It's like, well, that's how it works in life because mom and dad said so. Um, and we have three kids now and we raise them very differently. It's not because mom and dad said so. I mean, it gets us in trouble sometimes that we do this because we teach our children to constantly question and be persistent and never give in to other people's morals. So now we got a three-year-old who wants to play his iPad <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 we're done with iPad time. And it's like, you know, no, I want iPads. You know, you get this. And how do you teach kids to raise in a world where they question everything and they think in an, a progressive, emergent, evolutionary perspective, but yet... They also follow <laughs> the things you need to follow. <laughs> Tricky. If you yeah. answer that conundrum, uh, I think we take you into a whole new business model, Kane. I think there's a lot of parents who would love to know the answer to that. Yeah, it was a whole other topic conversation for another day. We homeschool our children. You know, we travel around the world. And so we have asked for a very complex life. But to me, that is what people are looking for, but have not been trained in how to have it. 
And so what I started to do very early on is I started to go off into the world to say, I want a very different life than everyone else. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't like these people getting like, I'm so cool. And I'm so rich. I, this is just the life we chose. We chose this life. We wanted much more freedom. We wanted much more wealth faster in life. And we wanted to do what we wanted to do. We wanted to do with our kids. We didn't want to be told who we could do or what we could do. Right. We respect rules, but we don't follow them. That kind of thing, you know? And so it, it asks for a much more complex existence. And when you do that in your business or in marketplaces, you have to be ready for that complexity and not everybody is ready for it. You know, I'm not the kind of guy that gets on stage and say, everybody could be rich. No, people who are willing to take on the evolution of who they need to become and evolve their thinking and challenge themselves every day and be open-minded, they are the ones who actually have the right to create their lives and the rest don't. And it's not about judgment. I don't actually sit around thinking I'm cooler or people are cooler because I think everybody's cool. Everybody's got a the, the everybody should have a wonderful, beautiful life and they all deserve it. But some people are designed to create, innovate, and design the world, and other people are designed to live in it. And so people just need to understand who are they going to be. And we are not, we don't grow up in a world that is designed to teach designers. It's very rare. And even the 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 groups and the schools, because my parents sent me to, this is, again, a whole other conversation, but I went to university by nine years old. I was at Northwestern University in Chicago. And, and I, they were trying to get me highly educated, you know, super fast. And, and the reality is even the best of the best schools, educations and stuff, they don't teach you what we have to teach our students or not even teach. We have to challenge, break that down their thinking, recreate their reality around how they think and engage. It's a totally different process, a transformative process. And luckily by 19, I started discovering companies that did that, that are off the beaten path. Gurus, mentors, uh, coaches, uh, idealists, transformationalists, evolutionists, therapists that just were, were in a different world of redesigning the way people think and re-empowering them to actually become designers of their reality, not just pretend. Absolutely, so, uh, absolutely amazing, Kane. So much in there. Sorry, you're still going. There was, there was more there. Well, anyways, so so to get back to this this positioning part, because this is this is a yeah. big deal, is that I find that you know we're not we're not trained in school to understand how to position ourselves, understand how to um, create the perception of value, the perception of power, the perception of influence, the perception of curiosity, the perception of of mystery, the perception of because you know mystery curiosity, massive marketing tools, right? But we're not taught those things. You're not taught how to create mystery, especially about yourself, right? Because all institutions and all tradings and most groups, unless they understand these things, are designed by nature to have groups of people following one order, one stamp, one maze, right? There's one way to do this. We all got to do it together. And so we're not taught those things. So that's what we started teaching business owners. We found that it literally exploded their companies, no matter what stage, launch, scale, even exit. Um, it exploded their, their opportunities, their possibilities, their revenues, their partnerships, their just you name it, it was it exploded. I uh, mean, in a good way, it grew, you know, like exponentially. And so that's a big one is positioning. And if we spend just today, even just, just diving into that, because there's so much we could talk about, you know, with business and growth, that could be a really interesting and a deep dive. It's a, it's a rabbit hole. You can, you never actually get to the bottom of, of understanding how to better and better and better position yourself in the world. I, there's there's so many things in what you just shared. I, I, there's a lot of rabbit holes I want to go down. <laughs> Let me just do a quick recap because Kane, there's so many things in there. But I think the three most important things I've heard so far out of out of all of those is is actually possible to love what you do and have an impact. You know, you don't have to be stuck. If you've been given one frame of mind, one way of thinking, you can challenge that and take your own route and follow your passion or follow the thing you want to do. And there is a way to make that happen. Number two is that. It's important. Talent and drive uh, can be important, but less important than you think. So it becomes uh, more about having a mentor or someone who's got the process that already works that you can follow or take their direction on. And number three, no matter what stage you're at, whether it's launch, scale or exit, it becomes really important to get this position right. The more you position, uh, you, you get the choice. You can position yourself as low value or high value. And it's probably against our wiring to go out there, uh, particularly Myself, as a British person, we like to downplay things and, and hold things back. Uh, it's very important for us to get that position right uh, in terms of high value. Now, Kane, it sounds like you're about to share a little bit about how, how do we do that? Is there something that we could uh, begin to do today that would allow us to position ourselves in a better way? Yeah, so first of all, I think those points were uh, right on. Um, so I appreciate that. And 
Um, I think what you just said was actually very important. And one of the reasons, this, this is something that I'm fascinated with, which is global positioning. So again, I don't know why I wasn't, you know, so many people in the United States don't even have a passport. Um, they spend their whole lives. I mean, the United States is, is you know, it sounds very kind of like small, but the United States is massive, right? As a country and there's so much going on. And although I can't fathom not having traveled, I've been traveling. In fact, the way the bug started is at 10 years old, Evidently, I was such a difficult kid from my dad <laughs> that he found a program to send me to in Paris, France. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, hey, son, I got a great idea. How about you go live on the other side of the world? <laughs> <laughs> so he found a school exchange program where I went and I lived with a, a French family in Paris and I went to school there for several months. And then that child came back and stayed with our family as, a, as a, uh, an exchange, right? And uh, the story goes, <laughs> you know, so far that he just needed to get rid of me for a while. He just he had to have a break from all the constant, <laughs> you know, trauma. So anyway, so I went to France and I actually absolutely fell in love, not even metaphorically, but also actually uh, physically. Funny enough, I met a, a little girl at that time and she was maybe 11 or 12 while I was going to school. And she was such a sweet, uh, romantic and loving uh, girl at that time. She was almost kind of a little bit like uh, my, my first um, my first girlfriend. Um, and I'm sorry, Kevin, one second, one second. Sorry, Kevin, I'm gonna roll back. Unless you didn't know we were doing a podcast. Hey, no problems. The editor can clean okay. up afterwards. So, okay. all good. so, so she, she was such a sweet, loving, caring, uh, you know, woman. So I, I actually, I had this huge awakening because it was so such a different environment, culture, foods. I and mean, we used to get up in Paris and my French family used to hand me a baguette of bread with a chocolate bar in the middle for breakfast. And I was like, this is like <laughs> paradise. I was like, we don't do this in the States. Nobody gives you a bar of chocolate, uh, you know, for <laughs> breakfast. Like, that's amazing. So, um, I just, I totally fell in love with the whole culture. And what I realized is there was a whole world out there. I learned French, so it was my second language. Um, and I realized there's a big wide world out there with lots of cool cultures, great people, and really interesting things going on that we don't experience in the States. So that put the bug in me. And when I came back, I knew immediately that I wanted to spend my life learning about cultures, experiencing cultures. I've been now to something around 40 or 50 countries. And, I, and it's not just, you know, in and out or just you're know, like, I will go there, I'll, I'll take time to, I mean, I'm a very metropolitan guy. My wife usually, you know, laughs at me. I don't tend to go to the country cultures. I tend to like the city cultures, uh, which I know are a little bit more homogenous, I understand. Uh, but, you know, I've lived in six different countries. Uh, we can, we consistently live in three countries throughout the year, every single year. Uh, and we were visiting 32 countries a year for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So I absolutely love cultures. And, and so that's what you said when you said you're British, right? And I know you live in Australia. Right. Uh, I'm American. I've lived all the way. I've lived in, I've lived in Australia. We've, you know, we've lived in Asia. We've lived in Europe. We've lived, you know, all of, we live uh, part of the year in Central America. Like, I mean, it's this expat lifestyle, actually, that is one of the evolving things that's going on in the world. That is a culture of people. Again, that if you think about positioning, where Kevin is positioned, being a Brit living in Australia, and the difference of you living in Australia and being positioned as somebody who's not originally from there, like this opens a colorful, creative and extraordinary world for people. And so I've become fascinated not only with just what other cultures are experiencing and the beliefs in the other cultures around positioning, but then what happens when you take that person and you move them into a, another culture, right? And then I don't even know if you know this term exists, but there's this thing called third culture kids where there are kids that are, have their parents are in, have from two different cultures and then they're living in a third culture. Uh, my first son was an exact experiment of that. And, and so are, I guess my, uh, my, my, uh, my two kids now, I've, so I have three kids. My oldest son who I had with a, a previous uh, marriage, she was German and Swedish and I'm American and we were living in Australia. Well, that's called third culture, right? And so when you think about the magnificence of what we can open up around these cultures, plus the complexities of what's going on in each culture. Again, this, this just makes for endless great conversation around positioning. And oh, so just to, what's that, sorry? I said, yeah, massive, massive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And so one of the things that I often say to people just as a, as a main bullet point is, is you're actually more valuable outside of your own country. 
And people used to just, I mean, I still say that, but, but, you know, I've said this to, you know, audiences of 20,000, I've said this, to, you know, to hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, used to speak to 60,000 people a year live touring around the planet until COVID hit and we started doing it all online. Right. Mm-hmm. But the point is that people would always, I'd always say that I'd say, you are more valuable outside of your own country. And you'd see all the heads go like this. Right. And so what we learn is that we are more valuable. And I'd say, why do you think that's so? And people would throw out, you know, different reasons, but the, the, the number one reason is that when you're outside of your own country, you are exotic and you're exotic to that culture. So you living in Australia, being a Brit, you have an exotic edge to you and everything exotic gets raised in perceived value. But there's one more thing that I didn't talk about a lot on stage. I'll share with you here, which is that when you're outside of your own culture, you have a natural inclination to to feel freer, to do things and say things and engage in ways that you don't inside of your own culture because you are weighed down by the systemic judgment. And so this is a, a way of many people feeling free. They move from the UK to Switzerland. They move from America to Dubai. They move from you know, Dubai to you know, Singapore, or Singapore to India, wherever they like to move. And as soon as they move, they have this sense of freedom and this weight coming off their shoulders. And it's simply just because they don't feel as weighed down by the systemic judgment because it's not their culture. Now, what systemic judgment is, which is interesting, which affects positioning and the value of businesses massively. And again, these are some things that people never even think about. No one ever talks about these things. When I go into companies and I start transforming, you know, people say to me, what do you do? And I say, I create breakthrough results in companies. So when companies come to me, whether they're six figures or seven figures or eight figures, whatever, they're not looking to just hire a consultant or hire another, you know, person who's going to regurgitate motivational books or the stories that they've heard a thousand times or the quotes. They're looking for breakthrough results. And breakthroughs come from somebody like me understanding how to unravel how a leader has raveled up their reality, both about themselves, their strategy of their business, the story of the marketplace that they have, are telling themselves. How do we unravel those things and have them see and have an awareness of things where they go, holy cow, I've been running in the wrong direction enthusiastically for years and I never saw it. Because the entrepreneurs are famous for just running in the wrong direction with a smile on their face. I'm going in the right direction. And I come along and I go, where are you going? And they're going, I'm going to the sea. And I go, did you know the sea is that way? And they went, no, it's not. It's that way. And, you know, through different processes and conversations and, you know, because these are deep rooted beliefs. It's not just like, oh, yeah, the sea is that way. And I can turn around and look at it. It's like, no, I know the sea is that way. In fact, certainty, righteousness, these are big things that sometimes we have them politely because, you know, they, they, the, the Commonwealth territories, everybody's very polite about their righteousness. Americans are very arrogant about their righteousness, right? But everybody's got it. Everybody's certain and righteous. Just some people are polite, some people are arrogant. And that is <laughs> the number one killer. If you want to put a headline on this podcast or, or you know, on, on success, the number one killer to me is not bad strategies. It's not failure. It's, it's none of that. It's, people fail all the time. You know, we were, we, uh, you know, you said at the beginning here that we've shared the stages with Richard Branson and all this. Actually, we, I mean, just to make, add a little correction, that we, we run events, we run brands where we bring in these people and where they partner with us on things. And so we've worked with Richard and, you know, I don't know, seven or eight uh, different projects and uh, Richard Branson. And, you know, we interviewed him one time on stage, last year, my wife was interviewing him and she was saying to him, you know, how do you feel about failure? And he's like, it's part of life. It's part of business. You're not going to not fail. He's like, I failed probably more times than most people in this audience. Right? It's part of the success. So failure has never, ever, ever been a determinant. Uh, somebody just sent me a, a whole thing on President Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, and the amount of times that guy's failed and got, you know, just just beat up. And oh my gosh, it's it's literally. I, I mean, I just read through it. I'm just like, I I don't think I would have survived. Though. Like I would have just given up and laid down. <laughs> you know, somebody run me over. Right. <laughs> I mean, this guy just went through endless, and yet ended up becoming a president. So failure has never been the issue. People who are running around worried about failure, they're just, they've got their attention in the wrong place. Certainty, certainty to me, when people are certain, they've lost the game. Mm. And again, this, this came from my mom, which was just, don't ever believe in what somebody has told you. Uh, Now, you know, my background as a musician and so I'm a piano player and and singer. um, And I love, uh, there's a piano player that has been one of my favorite piano players forever. Uh, You and your listeners may or may not know him, but uh, his name was Bruce Hornsby. Um, and he, he wrote a, a very famous song called The Way It Is. Um, you know, that's the way it is. Some things will never change. And the whole story is, a, the whole story of the song is that there's these, there were these, well, it was, it was, it was about Black oppression, about African-American oppression and, and how they had all these laws and rules that were ridiculous. 
Um, and there's a line in the song where he says, hey, little boy, you can't go where the others go because you don't look like they do. And he said, hey, old man, how can you stand to think that way? Did you really think about it before you made that stupid rule? And the point is, is that, you know, where people believed in certainty how things should have been, it's just, it, it's just never real. It's never going to be certain. Don't ever believe that the way things are, as Bruce says, the way it is, it's not the way it is. It's just the way it's going. And so when you are willing to constantly challenge your own thoughts, society's thoughts, systemic thoughts, okay, even laws, I don't, I'm not suggesting don't break laws, it's not worth it, but challenge them. People do it all the time. And they get them changed, especially stupid laws, a lot of stupid laws, a lot of stupid laws, a lot of outdated laws, maybe a better way to say it, outdated, they don't serve the community anymore. Maybe at one time they did. And there's a whole book on literally stupid laws like in California, you can't eat oranges on a Thursday outside with the sun or you can get a ticket. Like, I mean, there's really like crazy laws. And yet most people just accept laws and rules as the way it is. I've never accepted that. I never will. It doesn't matter how old I get and how like grounded I, you know, I, I definitely know I've gotten more conservative as I've got older. He was much bigger <laughs> rebel, but still that essence of question everything and challenge everything. If you think there's a better way to do it in your life and your business and your society, then it's right for you because there is no right. There's just the way people are accepting the way things are going. I love that. And so it's not the way it is, it's the way that it's going. And what I love about the, that specifically is that it opens up a lot of possibility. We can see things in a different way. We can challenge things in a different way and we can take a different approach. Uh, Kane, that kind of ties in real nicely with something we were talking about slightly earlier, which was around the idea of constantly questioning. And one of the key questions we ask on this uh, podcast is around the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. So that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves really impact the quality of life that we are having. Now, with that being true, what's one question that you've asked that's maybe had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the, uh, the many clients that you serve? Um, so that question, which is in, in um, resonance with everything we're talking about is, who said so? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That really ties it's, in with what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if I have a thought and, and I'm like, oh, it needs to go like this tomorrow. It says, who said so? Um, I mean, sometimes I answer, I said so. In which case I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I do have some follow-up questions. Um, but, but that's my first question is who said so? Like essentially the question is, why does it need to be this way? That would be pretty much a, almost the same question because that's the essence of what I'm asking is, why does yeah. it need to be this way? Um, okay. You know, so so I grew up in a Jewish family, and and there's a there's a there's a set of questions that are asked in certain holidays, like why is this night different than all other nights, and I, you know there, there's a there's a set of these questions, the questions that that you, that I'm looking to inculcate for your audiences, um, why not something else, and in fact the title of our next book coming up is called Why Not Yet, and it's yeah. it's it's the question that we have asked hundreds of thousands of business owners in our seminars and events live in person, uh, and maybe even millions because we, we've, we, we've had so many hundred, you know, millions of people could flow through our stuff on, online. That the question is, is, why not yet? And that's, that's the question. Why not yet? I, I love to hear their, their answer. First of all, it's definitely story-based, right? It's not real. It's not a real answer, but it gives us access to the story that they're living in. Um, I started touring with Tony Robbins and working, you know, being on stages and then eventually started running events for Tony Robbins, um, you know, in, in the Middle East, uh, you know, I, I started working with Tony back in 2010 and then we ran events for Tony in 2019 where we brought him into Israel for the first time. And uh, we had a massive event there, you know, like 20,000 people and then into Dubai for the first time. And I think that his approach always affected me with the sense of questions. And the question that we've always asked people that stand up in seminars because we've got into transformational since, since we were around Tony and I was into so much transformational work. We would do a lot of intervention work with, with business owners. They'd come for the strategies. How do I digitally market? How do I use Facebook? And I, and we would talk about that, but I'd say there's a much deeper conversation we need to have. If you really want to have a breakthrough, everybody wants to get rich, but nobody really wants to put in the real work. It's like Tony always says, everybody wants to get strong, but they don't want to go to the gym. You know, everybody wants to get fit, but they don't want to change their eating habits. Like if you really want to be a business owner, Finding the next shiny object strategy is okay and part of the game, but it's not the only game. The rest of the game going on is discovering who you are and how you're thinking and how you're leading your life and your teams and what strategic decisions you're making, not just what you're doing. And so we've asked this question a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand times. 
Why not yet? Hey, I want to launch a product to the market. I want to write a book. Hey, I want to be on a podcast. Hey, I want to, I want to launch my own podcast. I want to be in the media. I want to be on NBC. I want to be a, a New York Times bestselling author. And the question I always ask them is, well, why not yet? And there's an answer to this. There is a discovery that we made, which is in surveying these hundreds of thousands of business owners that have come through, we've done essentially what became the largest research in history on the entrepreneurial mindset. The, dis- the difference between those that are still thinking in an employee mindset versus an entrepreneur mindset. Nobody's ever done the kind of research in depth into discovering what we discovered, which is we've discovered about 110 beliefs that are systemic to cultures, the world, and to employees and people who raise their children in schools and think like employees that limit people's ability to see opportunity and position themselves as powerfully as quickly. Like, why have why weren't you a multimillionaire by the time you were 15 or seven for that matter? And they're like, oh, come on. Like, well, there are. There's a Canadian a young kid. He's seven year old. He's multimillionaire. He's been investing in real estate for years with, with his parents. And he's, he's, he, he is a multimillionaire. So, you know, how come? Why not yet? And then they come up with all their excuses and all their stories. And when we can start to go to work on it, they start to have real breakthroughs that they have created self-imposed limitations, self-sabotage cycles and patterns. Um, They have lived inside of other belief systems, their parents, their societies, their own that have limited them. And they usually have some real, sometimes some big cry sessions, you know, it happens. Um, Sometimes some real emotional shifts or some real awakening awareness. What they do have is they have a beautiful moment for themselves where they can see something they didn't see. And a moment when a human being sees something about themselves that they never saw before that gives them major insight into who they are, that can better themselves, give them more freedom, more access to their own power, more access to their own authenticity is a beautiful moment because it is a change that I think is what I live for. You asked me at the beginning, why do I do what I do? It's, it's for those moments. It's for those moments of seeing a human being have a shift, being in their presence and knowing that that conversation was the source of that shift, that release of energy, that release of weight, that, that you know, there's always maybe a cry, definitely a laugh, certainly a smile, a, a sense of elation, a joy. I usually get a hug. I mean, I've got pictures of people jumping up out of the audience and kissing me, you know, men, <laughs> grown men, big grown men jumping up and having this huge breakthrough of awareness about who they've been being and what's been holding them back and jumping up and giving me a big kiss and crying and holding me and weeping, something that they would never do anywhere. And it's just, it's a, it's that moment of humanness that goes and transcends beyond the next cool digital marketing trick or, you know, it's, that's, that's the stuff that I, that drives me. So clear. And that if we, uh, and you talked about the different games, you're talking about the game here, the game is shifting who you are and expanding your identity or your belief uh, so that you could step into uh, you know, a bigger version of yourself and accomplish more and achieve more because of the internal work that you're doing. So if you're listening, there's a really powerful question for you there. If there's something you wanted to accomplish for a long period of time, you haven't gotten it yet, or you haven't, you're not there yet. You know, why not yet? Why not yet? And I think if you journal down the answers to that, and then you start seeing the stories that are there, then we could begin to understand, like, are those stories serving you? Are they true? Or are they keeping you, uh, keeping you held where you are right now? Yeah, and, and remember that, the, that that question elicits the story. Is that the truth? It elicits the story. So, so this is one of the first distinctions we need, under, we need to understand is that your story or your answer is not the truth. It's not the truth of life. It is your truth. It's your belief. And beliefs are automated decisions. They're automated choices <laughs> based upon your structure of truth in the world. Right. So just remember, if you ask yourself that question, you're going to get the story. Don't don't go. Oh, well, that's why <laughs> there. You know, how come on that board says because oh, I got too many kids. I don't have time to do anything. Well, that, well, thank you. That's great. That's why. Thank you, Kane. I got it. No, that's 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 the start. <laughs> and it gives us usually the limiting story or the set of limiting beliefs. And then we go to work. Uh, there's a, a great uh, transformationalist or, or personal development uh, expert named uh, Byron Katie. She has a stuff called The Work. Right. And she's brilliant. She's she's done great work. And I studied her, you know, 25 years ago. And of course, you never you never stop studying personal development work. You just get attracted to something else. And uh, she would always say to her her audience when they would say she'd you know, she asked them questions and they give her the story. And she'd say, OK, well, are you ready to do the work? And it was it was a great name because that's really what you do. You have to do the work on yourself. And so once you get the story, once you ask yourself the question, why not yet start journaling these 
these stories down because once you bring them to light, once you bring them to awareness, it's because some people never ask themselves these questions. I mean, you'd be shocked, Kevin. I mean, I go in, I mean, your listeners might be a very aware, highly evolved group of, of leaders or, but I go in and out of companies all the time where leaders have never had the opportunity or anybody that's come into their lives to ask them these questions and work with them on these questions. And so they just never do it. They always kind of feel it's touchy feely coaching crap. Well, I mean, look, even top executives need to dive deep. You know, not necessarily because we need to get touchy feely or have a bunch of tears. And maybe we have that, but it's to challenge ourselves. Great leaders challenge themselves and they challenge the way they think. So when you ask yourself that question, journal down the answers, put them on notes, put them on your computer, put them on the hand, handwritten journal, whatever works for you. And just know that when you create awareness, it immediately loses a little bit of its charge. It doesn't go away. It doesn't stop having its effect, but it starts to get a little loose, a little loosened up. Um, this is a really bad metaphor, but we just came out of COVID. <laughs> so I'm going to just say it's, it's a little like getting that phlegm off your chest, right? Like at some point you guys just, you just got to get started loosening up, right? It doesn't take away everything, but you got to get it loosened up. And so that's what we're doing here. We're just starting to loosen everything up so we can start to have movement, but then you have to work with somebody. You have to dive in with a coach like Kevin or like myself or, or an extraordinary coach, not just any, there's a lot of garbage out there in the coaching industry, a lot of garbage, a lot, a lot, a lot of garbage. I mean, it's just a lot, right? And then there's the people that have crafted their skills, honed their talent and spent decades understanding how to shift leaders of organizations. And those people are worth their weight in gold. Whatever they charge you, you pay it because you're going to make it back in terms of ROI. And I invested, I've invested millions in coaching, millions upon millions in coaches, consultants, advisors, but top shelf people have made a massive difference. I mean, here I'm 44 years old, I'm sitting in multi-million dollar homes on, on you know, coast, Jeff Bezos has his, his yacht parked out, you know, about a hundred uh, you know, feet on the water here from our from our house. His helicopter actually just came in, they just dropped off people. And like, that's that's the difference. That's the, like, when you do the work, that's the difference. You get to, you get to sit in your gorgeous places, having your gorgeous life. Not that that's the, that's not the goal, the money is not the goal. It's just a nice to have. It's a nice, we're all, we're all traveling on the same journey towards death. The, just the question is, do you want to ride in a phantom Rolls Royce or you want to ride in a beat up old Nissan? It doesn't make you any better, cooler, more important or anything. It just makes the ride a little sweeter, a little nicer, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want that sweeter ride, you have to do the work. And that's how we always looked at it. So if you want the, uh, the yacht or the Jeff Bezos helicopter or the multi-million dollar apartment there in Sardinia, then the question is, well, why not yet? Why don't you have it yet? That's right. Uh, That's right. Very, very, very thought-provoking, Kane. And it's the answers that come out. And I think the important piece in there that you emphasize, and I've heard it said this way before, yes, there are beliefs, belief systems that come out and belief systems short for BS, right? So we things that we, uh, we buy into and hold on to, which they, they may or may not be true. And sometimes it may be true, but they're not serving you. So we need to, uh, to, to rip those up, find a new way to, to get the outcome that you're looking for. Kane, it's been a really insightful question in like 126 episodes. I've not had anyone else ask that question. And it, it's very thought provoking, very powerful. Um, I think it's anyone who's listening who didn't hear episode number 124 with uh, our colleague, Kevin Pates. He asked a very good follow-up question on there. Very similar to the Byron Katie question, which is once you elicit those stories, ask yourself, is this true? Is this absolutely true? And if it's not true, then, you know, then right. how do we find another way? And it's uh, so if you haven't heard that episode, then definitely uh, delve into that one. Kane, uh, you've been so very generous with your time and energy uh, today. And there's so much insights here. This may even need to be two podcast episodes. Uh, I'd love to ask you for the people listening who feel really connected with your message and the things that you say, where would be a good place for them to come in, uh, find you, see you, hear you? Sure. Um, well, so we certainly run trainings and events. We run them all year long online because we love to train, educate, uh, and we love to do it pretty much for free because we just feel everybody should be able to get access to education uh, globally, no matter what situation they're in. Um, I personally work with leaders of uh, seven-figure companies. Uh, I, I take on a few high size, six figure a year business owners as well, but I'm really looking for driven, passionate business owners that are looking to scale up their companies. Um, and they want to work on things like their positioning, or they want to work on things that we have just mastered, like, uh, you know, the live events, for example, I've been running live events and, and concerts and, and expos and, and conferences since I was a teenager. So people who are looking to scale up their brands, uh, scale up their, their companies, or they want to work with a positioning expert. Um, internationalize their company, whatever they're at. 
um, they can just basically, honestly, just look me up, just find me on social media, give me a message. Um, that's the place I do business. Um, I'm not, I don't have a huge social media following we have over the years and done things like it's just not my deal anymore. What I do is I just focus on working on people's businesses. So go find me on, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. You can just find me online, find me somehow. Uh, we've got a podcast as well. Um, and uh, if you send a message, one of my assistants in the different areas will pick it up and uh, they can let you know how we can schedule a time to get a talk and see if we'd be a fit to you know, help on their company or help on their boards or just assist them in growing where they want to go. Okay. You can hunt Kane down. And if you'd like some help and some support with that, check in the show notes, wherever you're listening to this. And I will pop the link to, uh, to Kane's website. So you can uh, maybe find him there. Yeah. We, get, we got a website somewhere too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so. He has a website. I know he does. And I'll definitely share that with you. Kane, I have one final question for you. You've uh, accomplished so many things in your life and probably beyond what many other people would even uh, dream of or imagine. But uh, what's maybe one thing that would, would be on your bucket list that you're still looking forward to accomplishing or, or targeting to achieve in the future? Well, wow. Um, you know, when, when you say that, I think about places to travel to. And, um, you know, I, I think I, I think my, my biggest, and this sounds a little, maybe sounds even a little cheesy, but I'm just, it just is what it is. Um, my, my favorite thing right now is watching my kids grow up and being able to in, in, uh, empower them uh, with the things that they need to get ahead very quickly. I think that as parents, this is our, our number one, uh, you know, passion anyways with our children is to help them get ahead faster than we were. Um, except that differently than my parents and, and, and um, well, I guess every parent probably feels this way, but we feel like we studied and created a set of tools that helps humanity evolve very quickly. And we're seeing that already. My oldest son, who's uh, just turning 13, He's already started two different businesses, small businesses, but he's already started two of them. One is a, a high-end dog basket business. Um, and the other one, he was just helping artists take their art and turn it into NFTs. And so, um, and, you know, starting to make money on both of those things. And, you know, he's using it to, he, he recycled some of the money he made at his company into flight simulators because he loves flights. So he's learning to fly and he's actually paying for flight, his own flying lessons uh, because there's no, there's actually no age uh, on going up for flying lessons. I mean, they can't get their license till they're 18, but so he's just really, really uh, brightly, putting some of these pieces together. Um, we have a seven-year-old daughter who we've been training in entertainment and performance since she was very, very little. Um, and she's at seven years old now. She's performing in groups all over and touring and going to Disney and performing. And so really, I think my bucket list, um, the thing that, I've, that I would always want to do before I die is I want to see my kids um, be able to create their careers the way I did, um, which is just doing things that they love to do and, and crushing it. So to me, the financial side is important because you want to be able to take care of your families, contribute to your communities, have fun, live the nice life, that kind of stuff. And so just being passionate or talented, I know is not enough. And so although we are working on their passions and their talents, we are also working on them understanding how to take those talents to a marketplace and be able to serve people as well as make great money. And so my bucket list, the thing that will allow me to sort of peacefully go, ah, I've done it. It's not about traveling anymore. I've been, you know, you know, whatever, 40, 50, 60 countries of, you know, I've kind of lived my life and I'm 44. I've done more than most people have done in their entire lifetime, sometimes 10 times over. So for me now, it's about passing that legacy along and being able to see my kids um, create the businesses that they want and start to create the technologies that will change the world. I think our kids are going to change the climate crisis or they're going to perish with it. Um, and so I think they have a very, a very important responsibility on their shoulders. So I talked to my son a lot about, um, you know, how he can be thinking about creating, you know, carbon CO2, you know, emissions technologies and how he can reconstruct cars to do things. And, you know, we talk a lot about that. So that's my bucket list. My bucket list is to, as I get older, to see my kids move into um, careers that they love, businesses that they are, you know, excited by, that they're crushing it, making a lot of money and that's helping and serving the world in powerful ways. So when that's done, I'm pretty much done. <laughs> then whatever, okay. then it's just more yachting and caviar and, and whatever until I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, yeah, a decent bucket list item and uh, many more years uh, to, to fulfill that, that wish. And uh, it's something that you get to enjoy along the way. And it's so exciting if you're an artist listening then and uh, you'd like uh, Ari to help you out with uh, turning your art into NFTs, then That's right. definitely hunt, hunt Kane, Kane down. Kane, thank you so much. It's been uh, so amazing. Uh, we really appreciate all the time and energy you shared today. If there is one, uh, is there one final message you'd like to share with the audience? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, so a lot of people have gone through some very difficult times um, in the last couple of years. And, and many, you know, we have so many companies and we've, we've gone through difficult times as well with our companies um, because we encapsulate each company. So it's not just like if something's happening, we just throw more money at it from another company. Everything is very siloed. So if a company is struggling, it's struggling. And when it struggles and people have to be let go because the, you know, the P&L doesn't work anymore with carrying that much weight, like it's, it's very difficult on everybody. And I just think every something that um, made me feel a little better um, was when I started uh, talking to some of my friends, uber successful people who were running nine figure companies and, and beyond, and just also sharing that they were having very difficult times in the changes. The world has really changed and it really did. It wasn't a hiccup. It wasn't a speed bump. It has changed. Paradigms have shifted. And it's, we're still feeling the effects. I mean, not only did was COVID a huge paradigm shift, but of course, right now we're going through, uh, you know, what I would consider a global war, because even if, even if it's not really a world war, it's still a world emotion um, that people are going through. And, and you know, human, humanity is a global, it's a global game. And so there's, you know, there's, there's feelings around what's going on in Ukraine and for the people there and that. And also, there's also sadness and feelings for people in Russia and just humanity in general, right? So there's a lot of turmoil going on. And I think that um, if there's one thing that I will that I want to share that I want people to think about is that um, everybody's going through it. Um, you will be fine. You will go through it. You will be strong. And this too shall pass. And we will arrive at a place that's more stable. Or you will you will adapt. And so just know that whatever you're going through, if you're going through tough times, difficult times, big shifts, big changes, big pivots, if you're feeling alone or frustrated or struggling or whatever it is and what you're doing, even if you're even if you're crushing it, but you feel like oh my gosh, this is such a different world. Whatever the emotion is, just understand that we're all going through those things and that you're, you're not alone. And that if you're going through a tough time, that it will, it will, you'll get back to some great place. You just need to keep looking for the right help and the right people to support you. And that's the number one thing that men especially don't do is leaders in business is they keep thinking, I got a white, not got a white knuckle to hold on and figure it out myself. Go find great advisors, mentors, coaches. You got two here on this, on this meeting. Kevin's extraordinary. Look him up, talk to him, hire him, call me. Let's do it. Like, I mean, you know, just find people. This is how we work as leaders of organizations, no matter how little or how big I've coached fortune 500 CEOs. I've coached, you know, people starting their businesses out of their homes with zero revenue. Like it doesn't matter. Everybody in business needs support and needs help. So go find somebody. I love that. Kane, very powerful message. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Kevin. I appreciate it. Great questions. And uh, I'd come back anytime and do this again.